Welcome to Dearborn Open Mic. Thank you for being here. Um, it's hopefully going to be an amazing night. We have so many great people sharing their art, and I'm so excited. Um, so uh, before I introduce Wissam, so he can give a really great um, lecture about Arab flags and like the color of revolution, I would, you know, my shorthand name for it. Um, I was thinking I might share a poem. I don't know how anybody feels about that. You feeling good? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. That makes me feel so excited. Um, so I don't know if anybody's familiar about what occurred not too long ago um, about uh, the woman Isra and Palestine um, and the, the issue of honor killings. I hate using the word honor killing because it's, even though it's like our baggage and our um, communities right to address the problem. When you use that word, it's so totally loaded. And um, a lot of Islamophobia comes into the mix. A lot of um, just rampant Arab racism comes into it also, and it makes me upset. So the term is very problematic. Um, and anytime I get into a discussion with somebody, they always wanna talk about the term. Um, for me, um, to process that event, I wrote a poem. Uh, because it's really hard being a Arab woman with like all these expectations on you to be like the Virgin Mary while you see Arab men just being <laughs> themselves and it's totally fine. Um, so I named this poem The Volvo's Price and I'll read it for you guys. A stick of gum, a pretty penny, shining dangling gold as old as the oldest profession. Give it all so I can be shackled to the sex I was destined for, to this honor sent from far off mountain clouds and flower pistons pressed into pages. I don't flip, flinch at the set price. The Hajis taught me as much with their sunflower seeds and boomerang slippers. In the eyes of honor, we are doful ghazals, an invitation for a ghazu, prizes to be plundered and paraded on bed sheets. I reject this name of weaker sex, for have you ever lived with a price on your head and lived to tell the tale? Um, and that was my poem. Thank you, guys. Uh, that's like a first draft. It was good, though. It was good. OK. <laughs> um, so yeah, now uh, Wissam is going to come up here and give us like a cool crash course of the Arab flags, which I'm super excited about. Um, and yeah, thank you, guys. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we've scheduled to have uh, Mr. Ron Jaber speak about a topic today, but he had just had the surgery in his hands, and he could not make it. And um, as one of the organizers of Dearborn Open Mic, we have this backup lecture, which uh, I've always been looking forward to give it. And now it's the opportunity to really participate with this. It's interesting how we uh, hold so, ma so many things dear to us and close to us that sometimes we don't understand uh, uh, the symbolism behind them or what, what do they mean. And uh, I found that uh, flags usually carry so much uh, sim national symbolism and history into them. And it would be uh, far reaching beyond just understanding the flags to talk about Arab flags. There are many themes uh, that when we understand the Arab flags, we will see through the flags into these uh, themes in our history. Now we have about 23 Arabic countries and each flag has its history. I have in this presentation 100 slides by itself, which means if I speak half a minute per slide, uh, that is an hour. So I'm not going to go through the whole presentation, but I'm going through the introduction, some of the symbolism, and then you can decide for yourself you can understand the flags yourself when you see them. Any flag, any Arabic flag you'll see, you'll understand from, from this, uh, some of the introductions. If we have some extra time, then you'll pick a country and I'll go to it and we'll talk about its flag in details. So, first of all, symbols. So, uh, before, let's start before Islam. So before Islam, Arabia, uh, the, the, at that time in general, flags were not very ornamented. They were not very sophisticated. It was an age of illiteracy. 
it's narrated that there, there were about 11 people who knew how to read and write in Mecca when Islam came about. So the illiteracy rate was, was very high. And it's, it was not a sign of ignorance, it's just that people dealt in a different medium. So Arabs, they dealt with uh, so, so many uh, oral mediums. So they memorized and they uh, uh, communicated using poetry and prose and they memorized, memorized it in a way that would be uh, not natural to us today but it was very natural at that time. Um, sorry, I have to turn this on. When you, when you run five committees at the same time. <laughs> you mean men can multitask? <laughs> Not good, as you can see. So um, the flag of Quraysh, basically, the, the tribe from which uh, uh, Islam was born, the, it was mostly a black flag uh, because the black fiber and the white fiber were the two most common fibers. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there are a type of uh, eagles that lived very specifically in the Gulf area, in the, in the Arabia, that were uh, used for uh, hunting uh, as a sport and a tradition in Arab tribes. So the, this is called Uqab Quraysh. It's, uh, a type of eagle that was used sometimes drawn very poorly on the flag as a symbol uh, of Quraysh. That was the only symbol before Islam during uh, that time. Now, uh, when Islam came, Islam came also uh, as a, uh, um, a revolution against paganism. So uh, wanted to avoid using any kind of symbol that would fall into the same pitfalls of paganism. Uh, did not want to use any objectification of any divinity. So also stayed away from any symbols. So the theoretical answer, the theological answer is there's no symbols in Islam. There's no physical symbols in Islam. Nevertheless, sociology will force you to have symbols because it's a human nature to associate images with things. So eventually, uh, people will associate certain symbols like we see today. If I ask you what symbols of Islam, you'll give me a few of them. This is just a natural uh, evolution in society. But Islam as a theory did not present any uh, symbols. So uh, Prophet Muhammad, when he went into battle, so people at that time in battles, they need to have a flag for a necessity. So they would have a color fabric any color available to symbolize the, the, the army. So they would use any fabric available. So they used uh, white, they used black, they used yellow. One time uh, he asked uh, his wife Aisha to give him a part of her scarf, which was black, to hang it. And after the battle is over, they'll just throw away this flag. It has no significance. There was no uh, divinity or anything. Uh, holiness or any you know uh, respect given to that flag other than it's just like a, a marker you know so you know a raya with liwa you know like the different divisions of the, of the army uh, I want to comment about the flag that is used I mean you know this uh, whose flag is this ISIS. Yeah. ISIS you know it now as ISIS flag they made it popular but this was kind of the theory for the flag of the prophet before ISIS, and ISIS took it as their flag, and they made it uh, popular. So uh, there is a theory that that was the, the, the flag of the Prophet, and I, I looked at history very carefully, and it is very difficult to prove uh, this. So first of all, uh, the words, La ilaha illallah, uh, there's no God but, but God, this is not the font or letters that were used at that time. Next to it is a copy of the oldest copy of the Quran uh, found. It's like Catholic Rufi. Yeah, this is the oldest copy of the of the Quran found. It's a it's a Birmingham Quran manuscript school. It's a parchment on which two leaves of early Quranic manuscripts is written. It is dated back to five hundred. 68 and between 568 and 645 after Christ, which means between 25 after Hijrah to 56 
after Hijrah, which means like 10 years after the death of the Prophet, up to 30 years. And this is according to the carbon study of this paper. It is accurate up to 95% uh, carbon study. So this is the, like the, 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 the oldest confirmed copy of the Quran. And if you notice the, the Arabic font at that time, there was no Hamza. This is Surah Taha, Ma Anzalna Alayka al Quran al Tashqa, and there is no Hamza at that time in the font. So this proves that this wasn't really a writing on the flag, and it wasn't uh, known to be a writing for a very long time. There were no writing on flags for hundreds of years after that. This is narrated to be the, the Khatam of the Prophet, which is the uh, seal. seal of the Prophet. And uh, the oldest reference to that, to that is the letters are the letters that he sent to the kings in the year seven of Hijrah, and that can be uh, that can be traced back. Anyway, so this is a symbol that can be traced back. It has some historicity to it. Some of these letters are still preserved. They're not hundred percent authentic, but they're still preserved in certain museums. This is some of the copies of uh, of those letters, and you can see that uh, below there is the a seal of the prophet and it is uh, this way in the letters although some people try to claim it's the opposite way anyway so this is a symbol uh, that showed up again but uh, islamically speaking there is no uh, symbols in islam the star and crescent which we associate today as a symbol in islam uh, is actually dates back to 300 before christ the first time uh, this uh, started showing up, uh, more with the Roman Empire. The crescent and star has not been associated with Islam until the Ottoman Empire, very late. Right now, when we associate the crescent and star with Islam, that's a very, very late symbol that was adopted by the Ottomans when they opened Constantinople, Constantinia, Istanbul, when they opened it. When they conquered it, they used that symbol, they adopted that symbol. So you'll see that Sakar of Quraysh, you'll see it uh, on, um, on Arabic uh, symbols all over the place because it's the oldest Arabic uh, symbol. It was revived by Salah al-Din in the Ayyubi uh, era, in the Ayyubi dynasty. He used the same aqab, uh, the same uh, eagle on his flag, which used to be a yellow flag. Of course, what was the prominent flag is yellow. Very rarely you'll find the uh, aqab on it. Drawing was not a big thing in the, in the Islamic world at that time. There are some references. I'm going to skip them right now and go to colors. So the, the known color for the uh, Abbasid, the, the Umayyad uh, dynasty was the white flag. And then the, Abbas, the Abbasid dynasty, which came after the Umayyad dynasty, they adopted the black flag. And then the, the, Fatim, the, the Fatimid dynasty was a small dynasty within the second Abbasid era. Uh, and it adopted, it was the only Arabic, so after the, the Abbasid era, the only Arabic dynasty was the Fatimid dynasty. That was the last Arabic dynasty. Uh, uh, the last Arabic Islamic dynasty, basically. All the other dynasties, and I'm talking about hundreds of dynasties. Sometimes you'll have a hundred dynasties show up in a year. Mm -hmm. This is how much the area was unstable after the uh, Mughalian attack on the Islamic world. So uh, none of them were Arab except the, uh, the Fatimid uh, uh, Empire uh, dynasty. And then the Ottomans came and they laid uh, through the game, adopted the crescent and the star. Uh, when they took over the Byzantium uh, Empire, that was the symbol of uh, Constantinia, of uh, Istanbul, when they took it over, and they kind of adopted that. Before that, they used only red, uh, just by itself, and sometimes they'd add things depending on that, because it took them about 300 years before they entered into Constantinople. So, uh, but the reference, so where did the Arab flags, uh, Yasmin, you have to remind me about time, okay, because I'm very bad. You got five minutes. Okay. So, um, so, so uh, 
uh, apparently I'm just gonna talk really about the symbols and colors for you. I'm not gonna get into the flags, but I'm just try to uh, move in into 1920 because that's the basis of all the Arabic flags almost. So when did the Arab flag uh, was born? So the Arab flag really was born, the, the new Arab flag, which is associated with the new Arab identity. It was born really in the, when there was a revival of Arab uh, 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 identity in, within the Ottoman uh, Turkey. So there were a lot of Arab officers, Arab scholars. Uh, there was Asr al-Nahda, there was a renaissance that was born from Egypt and, and other parts of the Arabic world. And there was kind of a, a revival of uh, the Arab identity because you know the Arab identity was covered by the Islamic identity for centuries and when Islam has really moved away from uh, uniting everyone together and it became more and more Turkish then the, the Arabs started to wake up to their identity again so uh, there were efforts in Istanbul by the Arab to create like an Arabic uh, group that revives Arabic literature and writing. Uh, and uh, it was named Al-Muntada, Al-Muntada Al-Arabi, and it was in Istanbul, and I'm talking about the late 19th century, um, which later became, after the Arab Revolution, became al Nadi Al-Arabi, and it, it had uh, uh, chapters and all over the... So they go back to the, po the poem by Safi al-Din al-Hilbi, Safi ibn al-Hilli uh, is an Iraqi poet between 20, 20, 1277 and 1339. There was a big battle, you know, when the Maghul, uh, what's the English name for the Maghul? The Maghulians, Mongol. the Mongols. The Mongols? Yeah, Mongol. When the Mongols attacked the Islamic world and uh, Baghdad fell down and they kept occupying areas, there were some resistance in some areas. There were a lot of resistance in Bar al-Sham, in the desert of al-Sham, what's today Jordan and South Syria and parts of Palestine by big tribes on top of them Qabil of Tayyip, the tribe of Tayyip and they won the Maghuls, it was an epic battle and they won the, this army that has not been defeated uh, and Safi al-Din Hilli wrote a poem um, taking pride in the Arab tribe uh, won over the Maghul and in that poem he says that إنا لقوم أبت أخلاقنا شرفا أن نبتدي بالأذى من ليس يؤذينا بيض صنائعنا سود وقائعنا خضر مرابعنا حمر مواضينا Ask the high rising spears of our aspirations Bring witness the swords did we lose hope We are a band honor halts our souls Of beginning with harm those who won't harm us White are our deeds, black are our battles Green are our fields, red are our swords Hence the uh, hence the the colors were born so fil muntada fil adabi they created that flag based on the poem of safi din al hilli to represent the arab these four things as in the order that he mentioned them in the poem later on the first nationalistic movement of arabs was born in 1908 and they adopted the same flag uh, but they put the red on the sides and they actually wrote that line of the poem that was in 1908 1909 that was before that was under the Ottoman Empire and this was a secret nationalist Arab movement if they're discovered they'll be hanged like what happened later on, and that's why we have Sahat al-Shuhada in Lebanon. We have the field of uh, martyrs in Lebanon in downtown. That's where they hanged the Turks, they hanged all the nationalist Arabs when they discovered uh, their letters in the French embassy. And this was later on adopted in Paris, um, and there was the first Arab Congress in Paris 1913. And in 1914, that's the beginning of the Arab Revolution, they adopted the same colors, but they put the red in, a, in an attack position because it symbolizes revolution. 
So this became the Arab flag. This is officially the first Arab flag. Historically, this is the first Arab flag, 1914, the flag of the revolution. This was carried by the soldiers in 1914. This is one of the flags of the battle, which was later led by Malik Faisal. These we are Malik that Faisal. In my, in my city, the uh, Alam al Arabi Exactly, in uh, Amman. Al yeah. yes. mm -hmm. Aqaba was the, the command center for yeah, the Arab revolution. Yeah, it's very mm -hmm. high and big. Mm -hmm. that one's so uh, later on, I'm going to finish there, but there's an evolution. All the Arab flags, they come back to that. All colonialism tried to push away from these flags. So this, for example, was the Syrian flag symbolizing the first kingdom because they wanted all the Arabs together. But they, you know, they started with Bilad al-Sham, Surya al-Kubra. When I say Syria at that time, this means Syria, Palestine, uh, Jordan, and Lebanon. And this was the flag for it, uh, with seven stars, symbolizing the seven verses of Al-Fatiha. Um, and it's, uh, Jordan just reorganized the colors, just because technically the white has to be in the middle to, 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 in order for the contrast to work, uh, and for other, you know, some claim other reasons. Uh, and still, this is still the, the Jordan flag till today. Um, this is when, uh, when Iraq and Jordan united, they adopted the same flag. <clears throat> when uh, uh, Iraq became uh, a kingdom, they put two stars, means one for Syria, one for Iraq. So when the French mandate, for example, came to, uh, to Syria, they took away the Arab flag, they put this one. That Arab flag, for example, was risen in Beirut for nine days before the French went crazy. They said we had Cyprus Pico agreement. We've divided these countries among Britain and France. We're not gonna let anyone put any flag except what we decide. And this was the flag they decided. They said, this is the flag of Syria. So France had flags for every colony and their, and their flag is in the corner of each of these flags. But you notice they didn't, you know, they move away from that uh, symbol. Then they divided Syria, of course, divide and conquer. They divided Syria into smaller kingdoms, each with its own flag and you see they moved away they used blue something that the Arabs did not use at all to move away from any nationalistic uh, approach I'm gonna stop at this point it's a very long presentation how the the Arab flags evolved and came about some of our flags are prohibited in some countries like the Palestinian flag is prohibited in the in Israel till today by law but they they became lenient after Oslo on it uh, some of the flags of after the Arab Spring, you'll see a lot of symbolism going back to what flag they're going back to. You can tell about the movement from what flag they're adopting for the revolution. They'll just, you know, you'll know the whole thing by that choice. So anyway, I hope I uh, stirred your curiosity to read more and know more about, uh, about why do we have the flag that we have uh, and what symbols uh, does, uh, does it carry. Thank you. So the night is Noor Maghrabi. Um, she's a lover of all things art. She does beautiful henna work and she does really cool microblading. Ask her for her information after if you're into that stuff, which I'm sure everyone is. This is a Dearborn. Um, <laughs> she's a mother of two and she's here to talk about her work. So please give her a, a loud, like, 
like applause. I don't know. How does that saying go? Warm I always try to say it and then I, I like never know how to say <laughs> it. Warm welcome? Warm welcome? I don't know. It's like a like loud like applause. Something to do with applause. Around. 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 Okay, I'm always like, wait, what is it? Okay. Very good. I'll stand here. Hi, my name is Noor. Thank you for having me today. Um, I really, I feel honored and I appreciate this moment with you guys to talk about my art. Um, so I came from Jordan seven years ago, um, but I've been always doing art all my life because also my mom is an artist. So I had the material at home. That's how I discovered myself ever since I was maybe five, six years old. Um, I don't have much of my artwork that was overseas. I do have what I've made when I came to this country. And that rose was one of the first one. And the lady on that side was one of the first ones I did in 2012. Um, but I'm gonna talk about this one first because it's one of my recents and one of my favorites that I made for myself. Um, I did not put this one on my Etsy shop, so it's not for sale. I wanted this one to kind of represent me and um, just hang this in my house. Everything is actually hanged in my house, but it's also for sale. That's I just keep them in, you know, on the walls until someone buys something. <laughs> but this one, it's not going anywhere. Uh, it's not going anywhere. Um, so I think yellow and orange represent me. Um, so I use that for a background, and I also like to use. Um, heavy medium gel, something to leave some texture on the painting, something to feel. I know you're not supposed to touch paintings, but I do touch my own. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to feel that one every once in a while. It has a high texture. It's like, I, I wouldn't say it's a 3D, but it's kind of. Um, I love plants and nature so much. I have so many plants in my house. That's how I decorate my house. So my I wanted my art and like, the way I would decorate my house is my art and my plants. Um, I just have this closeness to plants and nature. Um, so this one just, it was, it was quickly done and it's so simple. I know it's just like white, uh, it's just yellow and green, but um, each color I use means something to me because yellow and orange are my colors and then the green for the plants. So this is, um, it's one of my favorite right now. I'm trying to I'm trying to look at it, and she said touch, and I wanted to touch it. So I'll wait. You can touch it. That's fine because this is mine. Oh, I love textured paintings. Okay. Um, <laughs> what do you want to talk about next? Um, I can talk about this one. I love calligraphy, and I I'm I didn't um take classes, so this is just um doing random calligraphy. It does say God is the light of the skies and earth. Allah nurus samawati wal ard. It's a verse from the Quran. Um, I used the galaxy as a representation for that because um, we we usually think of Earth or like where we live in. We, some people don't think of the bigger picture of where we are in the universe and where our place is in the universe. So it's it's life is a lot bigger than earth and what we have here on you know this our planet mm -hmm. um i wish i can see more i can't i hope i one day that i i don't know but i really love um the galaxy and wanted to use that as a background for that one um this one also um just a plant representation for my love for nature also the rose the lady in a peaceful moment because also I do feel as, like I am a peaceful person and I represent peacefulness in my artwork. Uh, the last one I'm going to talk about is the ballerina. Um, I was inspired by my friend, she does photography, so one day she had a photo shoot with a ballerina dancer and um, she had paint all over her body and I was obsessed with that look. I didn't put the paint, paint on her body in that picture but I did uh, use that as a reference. Um, this one took me about two to three years to finish because at some point of my life I stopped painting. Um, I had a child and then another child and I moved into another house and I didn't have room to put my stuff and my artwork and I had to keep it away from the kids too. So um, I did this on so many layers. The background was different until eventually it came into one piece 
after so many years. So this is the most expensive art piece because I spent so many hours and hours on that one too. Um, my favorite part of this painting is the ballerina shoes. I feel like I did a really great job on the shoes. Um, and that's it. Do you have any questions? How did you start your career and I mean your hobby or your passion and painting and what encouraged you to pursue it? I watched my mom paint. Yeah, when we were kids, she, she had paint in the house. She used oil paint and I watched her paint and she would give me whatever paper or canvas that she had and she would let me paint. But I used to draw on walls a lot and I used to draw under the rug. Like I would lift up the rug that we have in the living room and use some crayons and draw under. So every time she want to wash the floors, we do put water on the floors overseas. She would find some artwork. Um, so she, she gave me that ability to express myself so that is one reason that how I started just with artwork and how I found what I'm good at. But she didn't, like she didn't train me, but she gave me what she had to use. And I worked on myself. She had some art books in the house. She had like a bag that she hides her stuff in it. And that was my favorite thing in the house, probably because of the art supplies that she had in it. So every time she opened it for me, I would feel very happy to use some of the art books to learn. So I really taught myself a lot of things that she that was in the books. And then I didn't, I always wanted to go to school for art. And I wanted to be an architect and do something that's related to what I'm able to do, like my skill, my steady hands or whatever I'm able to do. But um, when I came here, for some reason, I thought that I can be a pharmacist. So I signed <laughs> up in college for to be a pharmacist. And for three years, I was just wasting my time. Well, I have some knowledge. I wouldn't say wasting my time. I don't regret, regret my choices, but I don't know why I thought I can be a, a pharmacist, but I finally gave up on that and switched my major to art. And I, I didn't continue yet, but I am going to one day because I just have a liberal arts degree right now. Um, the last classes I took at Henry Ford were art classes. And I was so happy that I finally made this decision to take some art classes because it was only two but those only two classes helped me so much like for years my level was similar and in one semester my level has improved so much in one semester so this is another reason for me to continue to pursue my career career as an artist and doing yeah i didn't have i do have body <laughs> art and by the way this is my client uh rida she's one of my clients and she comes back for him all the time and she came in today for some artwork on her hand um, and I told her about the event and she made it too. So this is only one day stain. It takes about two days for the color to show, but this is another canvas that I found to use and to put my art on. So this is also my job to decorate women's bodies with henna. And I also do the eyebrows, also something that is artistic and related to my, um, me, related to me. So I'm kind of glad that I've made ch new choices in my life to continue using um, what I love and to yeah. <laughs> yes. What mediums do you use? I use acrylic. I mix it with heavy medium gel for texture. Okay. I also use oil. So I have two oil paintings in the house that are not finished. Mm -hmm. But I have recently liked the oil because of how it blends well to like this one gave me a hard time working with acrylic drawing skin i found oil better to draw skin for drawing people and i used oil when i was overseas because that's what my mom used but when i came here i was introduced to acrylic it's something that i didn't use before and i liked it because it dries quickly yeah but i do like oil so i think i'm gonna switch back to oil soon yes two questions first can you well a request can you please share um your information as far as how can people get in touch with you if they do want henna or microblading, mm -hmm. um, including the number and the address, um, because I think more people should have some of your magic sprinkled on them. Thank you. Uh, number two, can you talk a little bit about what you would say to other young Arab American or Muslim girls who have a gift and a passion for this, but their parents are sort of, um, sort of trying to peg them into a traditional career path that they don't really feel inside of their spirit? Okay, so I'm going to start with that one. 
Um, what I would tell them is to really do what they really love to try. If they're gonna have a hard time with their parents, they have to find a way to do it. Maybe you shouldn't tell them about every step you're taking, just do it. And one day they'll know that you did what you wanted to do and what you, you love to do. So if you think that this is something people tell you, oh, you're not gonna make money, remember that making money could happen at one point of your life, but losing yourself because you decided to go with something that will bring you money, but also just forget about who you are. So this is not being true to yourself. Um, just like I did, I thought I'm gonna make a lot of money being a pharmacist. And okay, I was convincing myself that I love science and I do love science, but I wasn't good at it. And I started questioning myself because I had bad grades in chemistry. Um, so I went, so one advice I can say also to speak to a counselor too. So going to speak to a counselor at Henry Ford helped me a lot. And he told me, I'm glad you're questioning yourself because what are you doing? Like, look, he should see my artwork too. And he's like, look at you. And you think you're going to be a pharmacist. <laughs> it's not that he, he's like, it's not that you can't, but it's, you're here for a reason. And this is not what you want. And this is, you know, ideas from other people telling me pharmacist, oh, when you're when you're going to be rich and believing that right now, I don't really care. <laughs> because I am happy doing what I want to do. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, my information, um, you can find me on Instagram. I have two accounts for my personal account that I share my art on. It's my name, Noor, N-O-O-R, underscore Mugrabi, M-O-G-H-R-A-B-I. And my business account is Body Art by Noor. Just one word like that. And I work in Dearborn right here. And what's the name of the salon you're at? Natty B Beauty Bar. <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> we'll also post it with the video. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. I, I didn't talk about this one, I forgot. I didn't see it. <laughs> but this is also nature and flower. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nora. That was so refreshing in so many ways. Uh, okay, our next um, featured artist is Malik Al Madri, and he's a Yemeni American poet whose work delves into the liminal, the marginal, and the moment where meaning is no longer needed. Uh, please help me welcome him to appear and let's clap. <laughs> job of um, staying in what I was saying, I suppose. Yeah, close with the mic. Yes, please. Okay, this first one is called Masbaha. It's a shorter poem. Once I dreamt, and there was a circle of fire, and a circle of people, and the people circled the fire, and the fire circled the people, and the people were warm, and they were burning alive, and everyone was chaos, and everything was fine. Uh, the second, uh, the second piece I have is called. It's called Or. Um, I'm just gonna jump in with this one. Or. I'm riding my way back in the wrong direction. Or maybe I'm actually moonwalking. Or this is a kind of fast. MJ spent 30 days on nothing but water when his revelation came. He was praying to Bobby Brown, worshiping the burning bush shuffling beneath his feet, feet as beautiful and incomprehensible as the Quran is to me. 
And now I'm thinking, how much water did he sell up? Was it a month's worth? And is an ocean enough to make me a god? To produce my own poetry, prophecy? To write me into verse out of prayer and thirst? This one's called Evan on Vibrate. At least five times a day, you called to see if I've eaten, prayed. Such bread the body becomes. And is a lie a lie if it wants to be true, to rest like the rest, their rest and residue, dailiness. How to tell you about hunger without eating the house. How to answer without telling you about the body sleeping next to me. Naked, dressed in a sky and a blanket, soft as a sajada. How to ask you about her, about sleep, without telling you that I only sometimes sleep at home with men indoors. How to ask, how to ask you about holding, about holding my breath, how to pray at the peripheral, and how to eat what's left, when what's left are the seconds left over. And this uh, last piece is called uh, Thinking About It Over a Cigarette at the Coney's House of Zero. <laughs> Two feet into the infinite, and I'm thinking to myself, I haven't paid a parking ticket in over a decade. I'm pretty sure someone is after me in every city I've been in. Only I know the feeling came first. Some statements speak for themselves. The dead can speak for themselves and choose to say nothing. So let's say nothing when we pass cemetery, two feet into the infinite, and I'm thinking to myself, even if it takes forever to get back, I'll still have forever to do it, and even longer to want to again. No wonder the ceiling fan eventually learns to whine. No wonder we write in threes while the apple never makes it to our stomach as the apple what a masticated mess it's all become. Such noise and narrative, such churn. You'd think hell was a kitchen where all the brown boys go to cook. <laughs> Manic was amazing. Uh, such a treat because Manic barely reads, like, but he should read way more because his, his stuff is amazing. Um, yeah, so next we have our stand up comedian for the evening is Rafiq Baraka. Um, he started stand up in October of 2011. He studied at um, CSU, some California university in Fresno. I don't know much about Okay, this is on them. He likes bumper cars, and he performed at Rawe in 2018, and he performs quite a lot around Metro Detroit. Um, so if I'll ask him for his Instagram, and you'll probably catch him around outside of the open mic. Um, well, yeah, he's gonna come up and make us laugh. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Subdued. 
By what? Just everybody's quiet. Everybody's quiet? Yeah. Well, don't worry. We're about to make everybody start <laughs> laughing like crazy. Do you have faith in me? I don't yeah. think this guy does. I think Malik might. Malik, bro, what's up? How you doing? Good to see you too. I met him last year in Texas. That's cool. I just had to let my new friend know. Yeah. I got a ticket in Dearborn. Uh, that's just true. I dealt with it at the 20th uh, City Council. Is that what it's called? Yeah, that was fun. I was like, I'm new here. I'm from California. I got a new car, new job, and the judge's like, new ticket. I was like, okay. 150 bucks. I am from California, that's why I'm wearing a thermal because I'm cold. Uh, yeah, uh, can't wait for later months. Everyone is like one up on me. I already know it because you all know what winter's like, except you. Um, so I went past the Dearborn ice rink recently. Did you guys know they do Pepsi on ice? No. <laughs> it's a really good play that I'm writing. Um, <laughs> subdued, right? Yeah. It's like, ha ha ha, remember the eternal pain and do not laugh anymore. Um, I want to write a play about a Syrian refugee that comes over to America and is so malnourished that the only thing, and poor too, and poor, that the only thing that that Syrian refugee can afford is Pepsi products. So the Pepsi marketers in America start to see that Syrian refugees are buying Pepsi products. So they start letting Syrian refugees in to America, calling it Pepsi on ISIS. <laughs> It's like capitalism and terrorism. <laughs> Isis over here, she's like, off with his head. I saw that. No. Or was that no? no you don't know no. the joke. <laughs> oh, I was wondering. Because Isis doesn't look like people like me. It was just, you know, could be you. It doesn't. <laughs> Who knows? It's an ideology, right? And uh, they took a flag, you know? There's a difference between terrorists and Arabs and Muslims and dictators and refugees and immigrants. Did you guys know this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. There's a lot of people in California do not. But I said that on camera, but it's all good. <laughs> um, how are you guys? Lakers! Oh, shoot. Sure. The Bryant? Bryant. That's cool. Yeah. Nice. Old school. Very old school. <laughs> Did you see him make 60 points at the very last game? 60? Yeah. yeah. His last game. Yeah. The Warriors <laughs> broke the Bulls record that same day and no one cared because Kobe Bryant was retiring and made 60 points that day. Yeah. Good good player. Good jersey. We're matching. I should sit next to you later. Okay. What, do you guys want another joke or information? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> My brother would always get mad when I touch his laptop. I don't know who this is, but there's probably some fuel going on. Oh, the arrow on your hat. Ready for attack. We just had a lecture. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't know. You can, if you turn the hat backwards, you'll let people know that. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, Syrian, I speak Arabic, and uh, not as well as uh, most people, you know, but um, pretty well, uh, but I speak English too. When you tell people you're bilingual, they want to learn phrases that they can use in their own lives, you know, like, oh, you speak Spanish, I say hi, how are you? Oh, you speak French, I say nice to meet you. And not in Dearborn, but where I'm from, around all these like cowboys and military people, it's like, oh, you speak Arabic? What do you think of Israel and Palestine? <laughs> yeah. How do you
do you put ten dollars on Pump Five? Can you say that? How do you translate, can you get your slushy machine to work? Uh, you know, it's just a layer of it. Cool, this guy is uh, enjoying himself. <laughs> he's very closed off in the beginning of the show, but he's like, slushies, 7-Eleven. We're all like, 9-Eleven, hey, 9-Eleven just passed. Wasn't that an awesome thing? When I was younger, I would make paper airplanes and I would throw them into buildings. And then 9-11 happened. And then I was like, oh no, now I have to make two paper airplanes and throw them into two separate buildings. <laughs> <laughs> so waste of paper and planes. And then the third one, but I would just throw it to the ground. Huh? Uh, Pentagon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the Pentagon. Smartest guy in the room right here. <laughs> you knew? You knew what I was talking about? The thing that changed the world? Uh, it also changed the phrase never forget, you know? That sucked because I would say it all the time, you know? Never forget to brush your teeth and tell myself. Never forget to comb your hair. Never forget to hug your dad. And then 9 11 happened. Now I haven't hugged my dad in 18 years. <laughs> it's fine. He hasn't hugged me in 28, so it's cool. <laughs> What's up, y'all? Good. I think I'm getting jumped after the show. Oh, hi. <laughs> okay, cool. I thought you heard something about like Kobe Bryant and you just thought well, there was a game going on or something. I don't know. All right. Rasan, everybody. Let's give a round of applause for Rasan. I really enjoyed his lecture on all the flags. It was very informative and got really into it. Because sometimes when I do comedy, uh, I dress in those colors, black, white, red, and green. Um, you know, I have some outfits. I have some, I have some outfits. So uh, Israel uh, is having elections, you know, right? And it's like, where are my Muslims at? <laughs> they can't vote either. Yeah. Muslims cannot vote in Palestine. I have a friend, her name is Catherine Nishmadeen, and she's a graphic design artist. And one day she made me a pin, and this pin had Milhouse on it. And it said, be rad, short for radical. She's hilarious. And one day this pin fell off my shirt and landed on a cushion. So I went to go pick up the pin, but my finger hit the cushion first, which caused the pin to rotate to the pin needle side, and the needle pierced my skin, and it struck blood. And I was like, is this why Israel's so mad? Because the art is so fire? <laughs> Did you guys know, speaking of art, you use pentol oil pastels? I do. You do? Do you know if you anagram it, that you can spell stole Palestine LP? It's an album I'm making. <laughs> stole Palestine? Stole Palestine LP. Man, this is great. I like the Arab American National Museum because there's nothing like it in California. Um, this is a very awesome place. I think in our nation. I hope no one here takes it for granted. It's pretty cool. First time here was last year. Um, I took some photos of a art piece upstairs and I used it for school. It was the uh, kaba and it was a lot of charcoal raised around, or running around it. Running around it, charcoal runs, but it was supposed to represent people. And I used it for school for this presentation in my religious studies class. And we didn't get to choose who was in our group. So I had a couple of these like very white guys in it. And they were like, let's just make our Islam presentation about 9-11. And I was like, 
no. You know, I had to like be the voice. I had to like stop it. So I included these pictures in the PowerPoint presentation and they were like, what are these magnets? And they're like, look at Rafi putting these magnets into this PowerPoint presentation. And we had to present it. So what I did, hey, that's Compton right there. <laughs> Detroit first, everybody, I'm everybody, what's up? Um, so to end that story, um, I basically created a makeshift uh, kaba using magnets, and I brought it to class during the presentation, and I passed it around, and they just shut up. It was cool. Anyways, thank you all so much for listening. right now um, is going on. So our first um, sign up is Stephanie Mule uh, Mullen. Mullen. Yep. Okay. okay. She's going to come up. Um, and then we have one, two, three, four. Um, and then uh, I'll slide Smith. Yeah, I don't know if this is working. I messed it up, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, so Stephanie, come up here. And the mic is working now. Yay. So, <laughs> I'm probably way too tall for it, let me tell you. <laughs> oh yeah, this is real low. Hi, how y'all doing? How we feeling? Good. What's up? <laughs> oh, that's much better. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I have two poems, if that's all right. Let's go with y'all. Okay, one's very short and one is not. Well, I mean, it's kind of short, so. You're not gonna be here all night, so. Um, okay, the first one is called In the Dark. Oh, before I start, like, all this, um, the whole reason why I wanted to have my poetry reflect um, these subjects is because September is um, National Suicide Prevention Month, okay? It's an epidemic within um, the world, let alone America, from, uh, let's say, like, uh, I think it was World War II, um, it went up uh, to 33% more in the U.S., from World War II to 2017. And 2017 was a really bad year for me. <laughs> um, I struggled through a lot and I was like, oh, that's so funny it was that year. Cause I was like, ooh, I feel like everybody had a really bad year that year, it's just me. Okay, um, anyways. So, um, I mean, I think the best way that I had, before I did therapy, I think poetry was my therapy. I'm an artist, I do like all different types of art, but the best way that I can figure out things in my head, if you know it doesn't make sense, um, it kind of just pours out of me. So this is gonna be like reflecting that. So um, get ready to cry, woohoo. Um, <laughs> okay, in the dark. Sometimes it all gets a bit too much. I feel like screaming on the top of my lungs, but all I do is try to hush the thoughts in my head. My mind runs wild, my heart beats faster trying to catch up. So much it becomes sore, sometimes I just don't wanna be here anymore. 
There isn't a quick fix or a simple trick that makes my mind flip into the right direction. It just sits there and barely swallows the thought of how it hollows while it wallows all alone, shivering in the dark. And the other one is called Scissors. This one's a bit longer. Okay. Life is full of moments. And even though there are many that are good, I seem to only remember the bad. And it sticks to me like glue. No, it's like paper mache. It's tacked onto my face to over and over, piling up further and further until I'm surrounded in this dark space, no room to move, claustrophobia sets in, I can't breathe suffocating in my own mind, all because I let one attach. After one, it's hard to stop until I find scissors and cut myself free, finally being able to breathe once again, and the mold of my head was discarded below. Looking around, I see that there are thousands of them <laughs> on the floor. Noticing the one that I just let slip through my fingers, it is resting right next to the chair that I am sitting in. A landfill of paper mache head carcasses. The one to my left, I can remember, was a week ago, and it plagues my mind, sticking onto my face once again. It's like I have no control over my hands, and voluntarily, they, and voluntarily, they know the pattern all too well. The room slowly begins to fade, and I'm in darkness yet again. A vicious cycle, chest heavy, throat closing, can't breathe. Oh, how I wish I could escape this. But my feet are chained to the chair, and, my, and the legs are bolted to the floor, and there is no escape from this. There is only dark and light and fade and dark again. My eyes are tired. My lungs are on fire. My hands are numb. Now, where are those scissors? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Stephanie, um, being so vulnerable with us. I really appreciated that poem. Um, and for anybody um, that struggles with mental illness, maybe Stephanie would be a good person to like link up with. Um, yeah. So the next sign up that we have is Noor Juni. Um, yeah, so Noor, come up and do your thing. All right, so, hold on, it's my first time. So it's before okay. I begin, it's like, so I'm gonna start this off. I don't usually come to these things because like, I mean, I'm 16 years old and like the stuff I read about, most people say, why are you talking about this stuff? You're still young. Go like, go do what other boys are doing in Dearborn at my age. You know, like smoke jewel and then play a joke. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> so, uh, don't smoke jewels. They're illegal. Nah. <laughs> no, no, they so, are. Come closer to the mic. What? Come closer to the mic. Oh. <laughs> all right. Another thing is like I went all I went about this all wrong. So if it sounds like I'm like being loud and aggressive, my bad, I don't know how this goes. All right, uh, a girl's world. I wanna start this off by saying I'm not a feminist. I'm just here to paint a picture of what the bigger picture is. He raped her. He crushed her self-esteem like powder is dead, tainted it and sniffed it out like a crack head. What a shame that girl was to blame, pregnant at 16, like, oh, she's so hoary. I would never call a girl that word because personally, I don't know her story, now that's sad. Us men are accusing these women of what they're supposed to be. Excuse me. Or she wasn't raised right, but she was. There was, you looked at her, took one judge in a despicable glance. That's cause you're not trying to get into her mind. You're trying to get into her pants. Like what the hell is your plan? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I started off aggressive, but now I talk peacefully and calmly in front of your stars. So here's my message. Why do we sit here and talk to these women like they are some peasants? To all the victims, I give you my blessing. Now don't get it twisted. I'm not isolating anyone now cause men can get raped too. But don't you dare blame yourself, because it wasn't your sorry. Acting like it's your fault as the devil presses against your body. Now you're upset, because you can't walk no more. Everyone's talking like, yeah, bro, she a whore, definitely. How could you let that man do that to you? You couldn't get away? You didn't tell him to stop? Come on, it's easy. Push him away. I want you to stop. I want you to stop. Look at them. 
There's this heaviness on your heart, putting your soul in denial. I want you to look at them with good health and a bright smile. Tell them to shut up. Don't run your mouth with that demonic voice. Talking left and right like it was her choice. You were masking, then you were passing, Running around laughing, but yeah, she's okay. Thank God that you were asking. So you open your mouth and then a demon fell out. And then you unzipped your pants and that's when it all went south. Now look, told you I was 16 and I was sitting in class one day and I told you, the teacher told me never talk about something you don't understand. But that's when I laughed and had a doubt. No, I've never been raped, but I was able to figure it out. I want you to close your eyes and imagine these words. He grew a demon in his soul and then he asked me to come. But he pulled my pants down, bent me over, and my body went numb. I swear I was wearing my regular clothes, mom. I wasn't trying to mislead. She spent four hours in the shower after that trying to get clean. Now it takes, a what, takes away what you follow. There's not even a past or a hope. And then you deck, duck your head slowly. It fits perfectly inside you. Then it kills your body slowly. How do you feel now? I just want everyone to know that your sexual assault stories are different. And that you shouldn't deal with it on a daily basis. People show, share their stories all over the internet, but that's not where you should start. You feel like if you start talking to someone, it'll all go away, but then it doesn't. Like, why are you running, trying to topple the shelf? It's good to talk to someone, but please, please start with yourself. Thank you. So, like, I have to take a second and be like, wow, you shouldn't be smoking jewels. You should be, keep, like, keep doing that. Um, you don't, yeah, you never hear anybody talk about sexual assault in Dearborn. It's like very taboo. And uh, for you as a, a man to like champion and like come up and like be a true ally to women is wonderful. Keep up the good work. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, our next act is um, Rida Tadeb. Um, and she wrote underneath her name, Marhaba Enti Bent Min. So hello, who's your daughter? Or whose daughter are you, sorry. Um, yeah, so please um, welcome her. Hello everyone. Actually, I came here tonight to support um, the best henna tattoo artist, um, Noor. And I was actually getting a tattoo done today and we just had this incredible conversation about Isra. Um, the whole honor killing that happened there. And then we kind of just unpacked uh, why she was drawn to art and how nature is like a huge theme in her life. And that's something that her and I have in common. Um, and then I came here today and I said, well, maybe if I'm comfortable, I'll read my poem. Um, and if not, then I'll just come here and listen and support all of you. But I felt compelled to share after um, listening to Yasmin's poem about Isra. And I think that these serendipitous moments really compel us to share at times when we may think that it's not the perfect time. Um, there really is no perfect time. So here goes a spark talk that I um, gave at a convention in Des Moines, Iowa, where we met some presidential candidates. Um, and so it's called Marhaba Intimint Min. Hello, whose daughter are you? Out of suffering have emerged the strongest souls. The most massive characters are seared with scars. No other quote captures the impact that incarceration had on my life or the lives of many Middle Eastern families I know better than this one by the great Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran. And while some scars are physical and therefore easily visible, many remain tucked away in the deepest chambers of our souls. Access to them is limited or denied by their holder, by cultural norms that reinforce a blind allegiance to silent suffering. Because speaking openly about being the daughter of an incarcerated father is taboo. It demonstrates weakness and a desire for pity. By a criminal justice system that seeks to punish, deter, separate, and profit, rather than provide restoration, redemption, and reimagining what justice, forgiveness, and true community healing should be. My name is Rita Talib, and my talk, Marhaba Inti Bint Min, highlights how certain cultural norms actually perpetuate the harm that incarceration already has on impacted families. I grew up here in Dearborn, Michigan. It's a city that boasts the largest concentration of Arab Americans in the US. And we all know when meeting someone for the first time, it's customary to instantly ask them, whose daughter are you? To which a well-raised and respectful young lady should reply, with her father's name, his name. It's like a computer chip that decodes your entire past, your present, and predicts your future, devoid of your individual merit and potential. 
This past April, I hosted a criminal justice reform event at the University of Michigan's Dearborn campus. Afterwards, a co-panelist from Brooklyn invited me to a poetry event in Detroit. Unbeknownst to the both of us, my attendance that evening would be life-changing. We met the host, a man who served 29 years of a life sentence he was recently pardoned from. The encounter reopened wounds within me that I thought I carefully tucked away. I learned he served time at Ryan Correctional Facility with my father. He was there that Sunday morning in 2009 when my father died of an aortic aneurysm in his prison cell. There I was wide awake at 2 a.m. and no matter what I did, I couldn't sleep until I surrendered to the words of a poem that flowed so lucidly out of me. I vowed that evening that I would share my story publicly for the first time because it's only when we share our individual stories that we truly give others permission to do the same, thereby adding to the collective voices in a progressive movement seeking true criminal justice reform in 2020 and beyond. So this poem is dedicated to Mama and Baba, my incredibly resilient siblings who endured, and to any of you and to anyone listening in need of a spark to light the fire towards their healing. Marhaba. And didn't mean, they always asked me, knowing all along whose daughter I was. He planted his seed, but to them, to them I was just a weed, predestined never to blossom to some. It's a question deeply rooted in patriarchy, a cultural norm that produced such a devastating storm every single time it pierced and punctured my heart, raced and ached the shame I could never escape imprisoned. I was sentenced with him and did the time. Long before you met me and heard this rhyme, I've been pushing, pulling, connecting, calling, rising and falling. Excuse me, sister, is this seat taken? No, brother, it's all yours. It was yours before I even knew and drew the connection to the inevitable affection that your, your arms and shoulder told me. Come here, baby girl, and lay your heavy heart upon me. He had mastered the art of dropping the boulder onto their shoulder, making them the new holder of this weight. His intent to create a life and legacy not built upon a predestined fate. Mariachi Margarita, we dance la dolce vita. He looked into my eyes. My name is Rita. My father did 20 years at Ryan Correctional Facility. He died there two years before his release days before I learned I was accepted into law school. Sister, sister, your father was a gardener. He found his peace and he would be very proud of you. Tears flooded my eyes and flowed through me. I leaped into his arms, clutching, still yearning for a semblance, a remnant of my father. My brain couldn't process it all, pushing, pulling, rising and falling. It's the Brooklyn way. He came my way to Detroit. What a sight, a vision. I swear it helped heal this deep incision that nearly broke me, but woke me up to the dawn of a new day. No longer pushing or pulling, rising or falling. A connection was made. I, I am no longer shackled or shamed. You, you don't get to define me or my family name, the one that I proudly claim because a woman's voice, a woman's voice is a revolution, a just and nurturing solution. So now when they ask me, marhaba, inti bint me, I say, ana bint abd lihsan talib, and I surrender. I am no longer your offender. Peace. Thank you for sharing, Rita. Um, I have to talk after because I'm really into criminal justice um, from like an activist standpoint. So, and everybody should talk to her and learn more about the things that she's putting out um, in that regard. Because um, I really dislike police. Um, okay. <laughs> so yeah. Um, next up on the sign up sheet is Zach. So he's gonna come up and sing because he came last time and sang, and I remember you. I'm not the IT director. 
Can it be so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, that was good. How's everyone doing today? I got spiked. Good, good. All right, can I get everyone to stand up? I'm gonna get everyone involved in this. So everyone stand up. All right. Thank you guys. Sorry about the weakness. It's gonna take a while. Okay. So, just use the mic or just play it loud. We can do that. Is everyone ready? Yes. Let's go. say so. You guys ready? Let's go. See the light, see the smoke, see it's always non-stop. Mama said I got a talent, I'ma make it to the top. Top me, top lead, ain't no reason I should drop. Anything can come true, I'ma be my own boss. Lots of effort, put the time, one day know that I will shine. No one else believed in me, and it's funny, see them signs, everyone is slaying back. That's the first to remind, to face that disease, put the work, constant grind, see it's been a long way, yeah it's been a long way, way back from the start, seen a lot of bad change, seen some people switch up, drove some people bad ways, but my circle stayed small, why I got my own place, see them looking up to me, DMs motivating sees, people telling me believe, that for real inspires me, hope one day they'll meet me, face to face with loyal speech, White, break the scenes, love is bigger, that's the dream I can see it, get the chills, feel the high, feel surreal Like I smoked or took a pill, guess I'm really in my feels I promise God I keep it real, never backing, that's my deal Never anything is possible, dreams become real Yeah, hey, and that's for real Hey, I need the energy, you guys ready for the last verse? Let's go What's real? I'm saying how I feel. My brain feels lax. Take the ring, then I kneel. I play it through my head. Imagine how that day feels. Crazy moment, get the chills. Damn that shit. 
shit is unreal Give me beats and let me rhyme I'll come up with fresh lines Act like I'll be on stage Hella glam, see the shine Hope this message resonates If it doesn't, at least it's mine One day I'll be on stage Give me space, give me time Yeah Say give me space, give me time One day I'll be on stage Give me space, give me time Yeah Hey Thank you guys so much. Thank you all the performers. Thank you guys. That was super high energy. Thank you, Zach. Yeah, for sure. No okay. Um, <laughs> next. <laughs> I'm about to pass out. Please don't. <laughs> um, okay. So next, uh, we have a poet named Hadil. She's gonna come up and read some poems. Uh, we do have to get out of here. I think 8:50. So I'm not kicking anybody out, but the museum is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so Hadila's gonna come up and read, I think from her new book, she'll talk about it, so cool. Hi everyone, I don't know how I'm gonna follow Zach's performance right now, but I'll try. Um, so like she said, I just recently published my book last month called All I Am, and um, I actually had a book signing here about a couple weeks ago, so this book is just a collection of poetry that I've been writing for a few years. And the couple pieces that I chose to read today um, really represent about really represent how someone else's behavior towards you can impact how you see yourself, and just how toxic that can be sometimes. So the first poem that I'm going to read is "I Am." I am. <clears throat> Too short for this. I am the few remaining pieces of cereal at the bottom of your cereal box that you throw out because they're not enough to fill the bowl. I am the coins that you forget about in your pocket because they're not enough to buy you anything that you would want. I am your once favorite sweater, now worn out sweater shoved in the back of your closet that you never wear anymore because you wore it so many times and now you don't like how it fits. I am your favorite book that's collecting dust on the shelf you never reach for anymore because you've read the words so many times that they've lost all meaning. I am your favorite shade of blue that's no longer your favorite shade of blue because you've seen it so many times and now your eyes are bored by the color they once loved. I am the good morning text that once made your heart skip and your heart smile, but now you glance over because you've seen it so many times. You see, the bits of cereal, the coins, the sweater, the shade of blue, the book, the text, all of them have carried a life for your use only. To fill you, to dress you, to please your eyes and spark your mind, to start your day with a smile. I am all those things and just like them, you've had me too much that I am now not enough. Useless, collecting dust in the back of your closet, left in the bottom of a box, glanced over and forgotten in the pockets of your heart. I am, no, I was. The second poem is a little bit sadder, so excuse me if I get a little emotional. I've actually never read this out loud before. It's called Reflection. I look in the mirror and I see a reflection I don't recognize. Sometimes I see a monster, unworthy of people's time or love. Sometimes I see a disappointment, living a cycle of constant failure. Sometimes I see an aging soul waiting for the escape of death. But sometimes, most times, I see a little girl who doesn't understand why the lady in the mirror hates her so much. Will I ever get better? All I am. Thank you.
Thank you so much for sharing that poem. It was super vulnerable. I love super vulnerable poems. Um, I know we have five minutes, but I want to let um, Chris Gazada, um, he just went to Palestine. He's a really awesome muralist from Oakland, California, come up and just like talk to us because um, there's a lot to learn from him. He's so brilliant. So uh, welcome him up. Chris Fazala, y'all. None of you guys know me. Uh, I, I did some years in Dearborn. Back in <laughs> Ford Road and Chase, Papa Romano's. I don't know if anybody's OG enough to know that place, but yeah, yeah. it was uh, my father's store for 20 years. Um, yeah, so yeah, I just came back from uh, from Palestine and uh, crazy experience. Um, you guys' uh, situation there, you know, is. Um, very, uh, it can be kind of numbing. The occupation is very uh, present in the everyday lives in every single way possible. There's no way of escaping it. And everybody there talks about it 24 seven. You know how you could be in the States and you can talk about politics and people are like, oh, I don't talk, I don't wanna talk about this. Or I don't know, some people are like that. They don't wanna, it brings up things. But in Palestine, everybody is talking about it 24 seven. Um, and mostly also the people who are doing work, uh, living in certain areas where they're really affected by it. Maybe in Ramallah and places that are a little more subdued, they, uh, they don't, they don't speak as much or maybe they're, they're less, uh, they hold back or I don't know, they're trying to play some type of play, play it cool in some way. But, um, the trip was very, uh, inspiring to me as a Palestinian American and, um, the people there are very, very resilient, you know, and they're not giving up. And uh, it's very inspiring because their lives are completely surrounded by the, the occupation every day, yet they are completely, uh, like, I won't say happy because how can you be happy when you know, like, your future is really uh, undetermined? Um, but they are very, but they're 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 like full in their hearts, you know, and they'll give the you know they're ready to give everything they have, you know. So just to let folks know here, I mean, if, if anybody's been to Palestine or you know understands uh, what they what people back there go through every day, not even mentioning Gaza because I ha I didn't get to go to Gaza, but um, in the West Bank, it's uh it's very uh. It's very, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy right now. So I, I, I can't, I, I'm on, I'm on jet lag. Like I got here yesterday. I didn't sleep for about 40 hours. So my brain is a little bit like mush right now. So I'm trying to make, make this coherent. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, spit a little rhyme for you guys. I do music too. So I'll spit a little uh, rhyme. And close it off with that. It goes like this. Hopes failed by corruption, no trust in false leadership, destruction of community to cover up the seed of it. Dreams blockaded like the road to peace while aspirations barbed wide, but no one can see. No one can see past the apartheid wall that snakes through the Holy Land, cutting off families so they can control the land, gentrifying Jerusalem to Judaize the last of it, crushing homes on the borders, and that's wherever they imagine it. The future is disastrous from Gaza to the Nazareth. Killing of the indigenous should be seen as blasphemous. Zionists hijack the religion, claiming biblical ties, but many real religious Jews will, so, will say they're living a lie. It just seems common sense. We didn't start this conflict, this colonization justified. Now they're trying to take all of it. Call it what you will, but you will never respect it because our, our blood is the water that the land's been blessed with. Free Palestine. Thank you, folks. Thank you. How are you treated as an American Palestinian? As an American Palestinian? Is um, it different than how they treat the Palestinians who don't have like other citizenship? Yeah, yeah. Um, very, very good question. Um, so, it you know, it really depends. It really depends on the situation you're in, yeah. the, the place you're at, um, the soldiers you're dealing with yeah. in terms of all that. So, 
See, I was always mad. See, my brother, his name is Tarek, all right? My name is Chris. <laughs> <laughs> my parents, for some reason, said, let's name him Chris, and you know, Tarek, and then, you know, Chris. Anyways, so for me in particular, I'm really, so, and my dad's name is Frank, right? On paper, Frankie, he was born and raised in Detroit, my dad, born in, born in the city of Detroit to Palestinian refugees. Uh, so my dad's name is Frank, so on my ID, Christopher Frank Chazal. But another thing is that our last name, because we're so, we're old school immigrants, we spell it our name with a K instead of a G-H. That was supposed to be Chazal with the G-H. Oh. Spell it with a K. Yeah. So this thing, so we're the only people that do that. Our family are the only family that does that, spells it like that. And we're a, very, we're a small family. And so for me, when I got into the airport, I thought I was gonna get, I thought they were gonna mess with me big time. I thought I was gonna, like the first time I went 10 years ago, I got pulled in, they interrogated me for what, four hours and then they, they let me enter. But my brother was denied entry in 2002 or 2003, he got sent back. He went all the way there, they sent him back, um, you know, for different reasons. He, was, he, got, he got detained by the Israelis one time at a checkpoint. And he also got arrested in San Francisco at a protest between the first time he went and the second time. So anyways, I thought I would, you know, this time I was going to get troubled because I'm very active, you know, in, uh, but you know, we give them too much credit. We give the Israelis way too much credit. They're not smart. They're actually really dumb. Yeah. They're really dumb. Like they, pff, I, it was amazing. Actually, I'm like, kind of like, I'm happy they're, they're this dumb because for a minute I thought they were like, you know, all oh, these guys are like smart. They know all this stuff, but we give them way too much credit. Um, not to take away from their, their the evil kind of like uh, style that they do things because they are freaking, you know, evil. Like, not I'm not saying like every Israeli citizen. I'm just saying like Zionist government policies that it's evil. Um, but yes, uh, if you are... If you're Palestinian American, you have a ID. If you don't have a Hawiya, then yeah, you're treated a little differently. But at the same time, they don't know always if you have a Hawiya, then a Hawiya, you know, an ID. They don't know if you have a Hawiya, and they might assume that you do. You know, um, if a if a Palestinian in Jerusalem asks me where where am I from, I tell them Ramallah. Like to them, the first thing that pops up in their head is, oh shit, is he here illegally? Or is he, does he have a tasirih? Does he have a, a permit? Yeah. Or is he here like, just he, did he jump the wall? He's just here? Like, so that that also was like, there's so many barriers between Palestinians. So, but it really depends, you know, on um, where you are and uh, what you're doing. And uh, yeah, it's it's a lot, of, a lot of different factors that play a part in uh, how the Israelis treat you. And your last name is a big one too. So if you have a last name like Al Najjar, or like just some the typical kind of big Palestinian last name that has a lot of people in it, you know, most likely you had somebody who went to jail, somebody who you know has been involved, and in, uh, so they can like pinpoint you and say, oh, you have this last name. You know, some families are a little less known, but um, yeah, it all it all really depends. Yeah. But they treat everybody the same, like basically, like they treat, I mean, look at uh, Rachel Corey, for instance, the girl who was run over by a tank, you know, in, in uh, Gaza, she was run over, you know, she's a, a, a white woman from uh, Berkeley. You know, you ever heard of Rachel Corey before? Yeah. Yes. Never heard? Okay. Well, she got ran over, man. Uh, she was blocking a home demolition in Gaza mm -hmm. and she was standing right there in the tank, man, they, they, they just ran her right over. Her She's family, American, you know? Yeah, her family still doesn't have justice to this day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's disgusting. They're still, like, trying to organize. Her parents, like, dedicated their life to fighting against, uh, the, you know, the Israel, you know, because of what happened with their daughter, you know? So um, I'll say, like, it, you know, they like to, they try to play it like like they do care. But, like, so I was there in the summertime, too, which is another thing. In the summertime, I got the vibe that they were trying to keep things smooth to get people in and get them out. Cause that's when all the people, <coughs> foreigners come in. But when that's over, you know, they uh, they definitely will go back to business. I mean, they shot a woman today in uh, in uh, Kalendia checkpoint. I walked through that checkpoint like two days ago. And uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a mess, but um, 
Yeah, it really all depends. But if you're like Arab, you're Muslim, and your last, you, you know, you have a Arab name, you're getting treated the same, basically. Like they don't care who you are, you know. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta go. Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, um, thank you everybody for coming, and hopefully next time it'll be just as awesome. All right, just technical announcements. All the the performances today will be on dearbornblog.com, uh, Instagram, Facebook, website, YouTube, etc. Podcast. Uh, number two, uh, if you can help us with putting the chairs back, that would be great. Number three, if you're interested in becoming an organizer in Dearborn Open Mic, please see me or Yasmin. We need more organizers. Uh, and number four, please participate next time if you have any anything to share with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this will just pile them up.